كليم الله وموسى كليم الله ثم عيسى روح الله محمد حبيب الله بسم الله والحمد لله وصلى على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم I start with the name of Allah, one with no partner, no similar, one with no length, no width, no depth, and no perimeter, one who's not a volume and not in a place, and how could he be in a place when he existed before time and space? He speaks without sound, letter, nor language, not Arabic, Hebrew, nor Korean. He's not a light, he's not a spirit, he has nothing in common with human beings. He's not in the direction of up, down, right, left, front, nor back, and whatever you imagine in your mind, Allah is different from that. And I ask him to raise the rank, honor, and prestige of our beloved Master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the slave of Allah, his final messenger, and the best of God's creations. May Allah unite us with him in paradise and grant us a drink of his base. Ameen. May Allah increase us in knowledge, humility, patience, and comprehension, and help us put our knowledge into practice and grant us the sincere intention of Allah. Ameen. Thereafter, <coughs> We're going to go into the conditions of the witnesses. Uh, and if any questions arise, again, you're more than welcome to unmute. Um, and if you're, more, if you're more comfortable with putting in the chat, that is totally fine as well. Let me open this chat, inshallah, so I don't miss anything. Amma ba'd qala mu'allifu rahimahullah. Thereafter, the author says, rahimahullah alayhi. Also, two witnesses must witness the contract, which means if there is a need for two witnesses to observe the marriage contract, which means there is a need for two witnesses to observe the marriage contract. And of course, we spoke about last week in the points of clarity. Uh, you cannot witness that. Yeah, your witnessing would not be valid if this was done through Zoom or through the phone. <coughs> so these witnesses, they must be males. They must be adil. Uh, and if you guys could write in the chat what defines one as Adil, because we spoke about that at length last week, just so we make sure you guys understand that, feel free to write it in there. So they must be males, and Adil, and sighted, meaning they cannot be blind, and know the language by which the marriage contract takes place. I'm going to say that again. They must know the language by which the marriage contract takes place. Uh, about 20% of the Muslim world are Arab. Allahu A'lam, the percentages of those who speak uh, Arabic. Lakin, there's an overwhelming majority of Muslims who do not speak it. And so when you see the Nikah contract nowadays being conducted in Arabic, and the witnesses, or the groom himself, or the guardian is just repeating after the Imam and they have no idea what's being said, that how's anybody witness to such a contract? That's why we said, even if you speak Arabic, you can still do it in another language. So for those of you guys, I presume you guys are English speakers, you can do it in Arabic. Um, yes, in English, my apologies, in English. You can do it in Arabic too, but I mean in English. They can also understand the verbal exchange statement. Just like for those of you who don't speak Arabic, but if I ask you what does Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim mean, you understand the meaning of this statement. Likewise, if one understands the verbiage being used, then this is also sufficient. And also, they need not be asleep or fainting. When I was speaking with somebody earlier today, they said they said this is common sense. But yani the fuqaha don't write in details uh, that are pointless. Why, subhanAllah, look at nowadays, because of the advent of the internet, you have people who are courting and getting married to others in different time zones. And because of the extravagance and the grandosity, is that a word? Grandoisness, the, the grandeur of the weddings. SubhanAllah, uh, they stay up for the bachelor party, the bachelorette party, the night before they go to Argile, they're getting their henna done. On top of that, they're jet lagged and they're exhausted, they're stressed out, in-laws are yelling, the bridal party or the groom's uh, groomsmen, they're not doing their jobs. And then when it comes to the nikah, early in the morning, 11 a.m., noon, whenever they do it, people are sleepy, they're tired. And so I have seen people doze off or they're on their phones during the nikah. Uh, or they're chit-chatting during the nikah 
And it's all in Arabi, by the way, so they don't understand what's the khutbah, what's the contract, etc. And then these are the same guys who are saying, I'm the witness. MashaAllah. So they need to be aware of what's happening. This is a contract at the, at the end of the day. Uh, if you were a judge, if you were a lawyer, you wouldn't be too happy if the jury was uh, doing crossword puzzles in court, falling asleep, and uh, the witnessing to the facts, to the evidences in this trial are in their hands, subhanAllah. Therefore, the blind and deaf are not valid witnesses as we had mentioned. And when we say the two witnesses need to be upright and trustworthy, what does that mean? Only one person wrote it in the chat. Hopefully you guys are not doing chores or watching TV or multitasking uh, during this. I know a lot of people are comfortable with watching the recordings, but again, uh, this is the very contract I see year after year after year, people put very little time to invest in. And when they cry to the Shaykh or the in-law or the BFF, what was me? He changed, she changed. No, you guys put more effort in the henna party. You guys put more effort in the honeymoon. Uh, it, it's it's uh, surprising, mashallah. Um, anyways. So, someone wrote from what I remember, Adil means they don't outwardly do major sins. No, they don't do major sins, not outwardly. Uh, and they complete all the obligations. And their minor sins don't outweigh their good deeds. This is an Adl person. In regard to the outwardly part, this means as far as us on the outside, we judge by what's, what's apparent. So if the reality of the person is that they are not Adl, but from what I see, I've never seen them commit a sin, then in this case, I can judge them as Adl. But if later on, if this person says, you know what, I was a witness for your nikah and I was a fasif, I was a major sinner at that time, that in actuality, your marriage contract would not be valid. So, you're, so you can judge by what is apparent. However, it's best to have someone you're confident in. Don't just grab a friend and say he's apparently upright, subhanAllah. So these witnesses need to be Muslim, pubescent, sane, clear of having major sins, refraining from numerous minor sins in such a way that they exceed the numbers of the good deeds, and to observe the behavior of the people of his status. So to observe the behavior of the people of his status, this is in regards to um, the marriage contract. So this means the good people of his status. So if he is a trader or an entrepreneur, he observes the behavior of good Muslim traders. If he is a ruler, then he observes the behavior of good Muslim rulers, subhanAllah. And as we have seen, there are not many good Muslim rulers nowadays. And if he's a Qadi, then he observes the behavior of a good Muslim Qadi. He's not taking bribes. He doesn't do a slap on the wrist to someone because he's a family friend. But that same crime to someone else who's not a family friend or not a relative, uh, they get the gavel slammed down on them. And if he's a teacher, he observes the behavior of good Muslim teachers. Uh, and we spoke about that. Uh, anyways, we won't go into that. Some people, uh, they're a bit sensitive. And if he's a student, he observes the behavior of good Muslim students. So, for example, if he's in a ma'had of some sort, he has the etiquette, the adab of a student of Islamic knowledge. If all conditions are satisfied, then he is considered, in this case, an upright and trustworthy person. In this case, it is enough for the witness to be apparently like that, as I briefly just mentioned, which means it's not a condition that the judge investigates his case, or anyone to investigate his case, to consider him as upright and adil. So if he is known by those who know him, yani his comrades say, yes, we know him to be an upright man of good repute, uh, then this is sufficient for him to be a vowed witness. Even if he repents from the sins he committed at that very moment, yani before the nikah is conducted, that would be sufficient for him to deem him as a valid witness. However, and I'll say this, however, a lot of times people of knowledge, they are very detached and unaware of how the awam conduct themselves. I've seen some nikahs, uh, and I brought it up to Mashaykh, and they agree. They were surprised, but they agree. They'll say before the nikah, 
if you haven't repented, uh, just go ahead and repent for your sins. But they don't act like that when it's their own nikah. And so some people, following the way of the shaykh, or the ustad, or the mufti, or the maulana, or the pur, or whatever honorary titles you may want to put on them, they follow uh, accordingly. Despite the fact they learned in Al-Fard al -ayn, there are sins that if you just say Astaghfirullah sincerely for, the sin is not wiped away. So for example, if you owe people money, and you're jumping on flights, you're buying cigarettes, you're buying luxurious food, then saying Astaghfirullah is not sufficient. You owe those people money, and when you pay that person back, or if they excuse you, that is when your sin is alleviated. How many people they owe money? Or for example, someone left a jacket at my house. And I say, oh, this is a nice jacket. And so whether I tell them, people joke about it, or whether I don't tell them, I start wearing the jacket around, or the jersey around, or the shoes around. People just start using things. SubhanAllah, it's haram. Or better yet, because when you think about it in 2001, 2003, backbiting, yani namima, gossip, buhtan, slandering, this was not as prevalent as today. Meaning, it is easier today to indulge in these sins. And what is the judgment of the one who sins directly to a person? Yani you commit one sin to this person, you have the sin. But when you commit haram in the group chat, on the FaceTime, uh, in the DMs, because across the board you're just talking bad about everybody, apparently it's going to leak. Today you're talking bad about this person, that person listening, they're going to talk bad about you. Waldih. And so the sin multiplies, it compounds, it snowballs. Now how many people here, whether you want to do a show of hands, a thumbs up, a react, or in the chat, you have heard someone talk bad about you, whether it's true or not, if it's true, they still don't have a right to do that. And if it's not true, it's a lie. And it's come back to you and you heard about it. And this person, they don't know that you know. They don't know that you know. Or in other cases, they know, but they don't like confrontations. They don't talk to you about it. The judgment here is, if you speak ill of someone, rightful or not, because the group chat was just too juicy, or because you don't want to look like the, the religious person, you know, telling them, hey, that's not cool. Or because you don't want to offend your friend. Imagine that, offend your friend because you don't believe them. SubhanAllah. So you believe it, you perpetuate it, you spread it, you were present in the session when you could have left or warned against it. Just by being present, you commit a haram. And then it reaches this person. Yeah, so-and-so was saying such and such about you. And other people, they were there. They didn't say nothing, but they were there. Haram. Not just is this a major sin for your repentance to be valid. For your repentance to be valid, you have to go seek the pardon of that person. Now from a show of hands, or a comment in the chat, or a raise hand, or a reaction, how many of you unsolicited, no one poked you or, or provoked, or no one poked them or provoked them, or pushed them, how many people came to you and said, hey, I spoke about you? And you didn't know about it. Or, hey, I heard that you found out about what happened. And you know what? I just feel bad about it. Uh, I don't like to talk about my life. But I could say in my life, subhanAllah, I think two people. And I'm 31 years old, mashallah. And I'm very quiet and private. So imagine those of you guys who are more social. Uh, subhanAllah, I think two people have ever come and said, hey, I said such and such. Mashallah. A and wasn't right, and etc. Why am I saying this? Because we are letting the legitimacy, this, this tangent is very important. We are letting the legitimacy be on the shoulders of witnesses, of people who do not hold themselves accountable for their shortcomings. They don't care about the rights of other Muslims. Why do they care about your right to have a valid, valid marriage? You know, so Qalbi, you know, to. To take care of the heart of a Muslim is not light. Wallahi, it's not light. It's not just a Ramadan text, hey, if I did anything this Ramadan, uh, you know, out of the love of Ramadan, please forgive me. And you copy and paste, it's not sincere. How many people do I hear them say, I, mean, I just deleted that message, it wasn't sincere. 
and I know they were talking about me too. Address them, be a real man, be a real woman. Not just for the sake of marriage contracts, but because uh, what happens? People get depressed, they recluse, they stop showing around, they stop donating, they stop supporting, uh, they have a chip on their shoulder, they take it out on others, whether they re realize it or not. There is a very, very nasty domino effect when we harm Muslims on the right. And when the Prophet والسلام, he says, the, the status of the Muslim is greater than the Kaaba. And how many of us, we yearn for the day we get to kiss the Kaaba and touch the Kaaba and see the Kaaba. But then we treat this person like he's a dung beetle. Like she is just a tissue paper. She was cool today, she was with the squad today, and tomorrow she's worthless. MashaAllah. So, we don't have to investigate, Yani, their religious status. It is not a condition to wait and test him for a year, as is the case in other issues. So, in other than the marriage contract, Yani, in other cases, if he was not trustworthy, but then he repented, they would wait for a year to investigate before accepting him to be a valid witness. But in the marriage contract, this is not a condition. Um, before we go into the bride must not be within an idda, are there any questions? I'll give it about 15 seconds, inshallah. Uh, so you said that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you need to go up to people and like, seek their forgiveness for saying something behind their back. Mm -hmm. But um, how do we determine when it's better to do that or just remain silent and like privately ask for forgiveness so we don't like take things worse? Um, if you commit a sin, generally speaking, and you repent from it, it's better not to say anything. If the person finds out, you are obligated to say something. Now, if they don't know, you're asking, what is a better case? It depends on the circumstance. You know yourself. If this person finds out it came from me, Yanni, will it make it worse? Will it break their heart? And some people, when they find out, even if you're forthcoming, they're still angry, still hurt. But, uh, you being a man or woman of integrity, you did the right thing because the guilt ate you up. Um, and in some cases, as I've heard people say, I'd rather hear it from you than hear it from somebody else. Um, so you have to assess the situation at hand. Uh, if you said it to many people, uh, or you said it in a way where the few people there, they have big mouths, it's gonna spread. Uh, you know it's going to get back to them, or you know it's not far-fetched if they find out. You should address this person. And if the guilt is eating you up, uh, which is a good attribute, Yanni, to feel the shame of what we do, uh, then yes, you should go to the person and address them, even if they're not aware of it, subhanAllah. Um, and definitely do not let too much time pass over it. Uh, why do I say that? Sometimes you hear a rumor about somebody, and then years later, it could be a year later, two, three years later, you, you have very solid evidence that the, the rumor was false. But because of your emotional attachment to the, to the case, I don't even want to call it a case, to the, the rumor train, you don't want to believe it. You don't want to believe it, subhanAllah. It's very hard to undo it. Likewise, if someone found out that three years ago you said something, and now you're apologizing, they can see that you're sincere, but the heart, subhanAllah, when it turns against someone, it's very hard to undo it. So you have to see, do you value how, how much you value the relationship with that person, um, or how much do you value their the, the sanctity of their um, peace of mind? Some people get affected, mashallah. Uh, so it's not black and white. I hope that answers your question. Is that the wrong thing? Um, some some people are very sensitive and they have a right to do so. Allah created us differently, and some people uh, they can forgive very easily, mashallah. Are there any other questions? So it is a condition for the marriage contract to be valid that the bride would not be observing an idda or a post-marital waiting period of another man. So idda is that period in which the woman, after the divorce or the death of her husband, for example, uh, she cannot just go out and get married. And it varies per circumstance. Uh, whether she's menstruating, she stopped men uh, she doesn't menstruate anymore, is she pregnant or not, etc. So for example, if someone divorces her and she waits until the end of the post-marital waiting period, or the idda, then during this period, another man cannot marry her. Now, if she is in the post-marital waiting period because she was married to him, 
then the same person then, the same person can have a marriage contract with her during the idda. But of course, this will be further explained in the chapter of divorce. So what's pertinent to you for a woman who is menstruating, she has a normal menstrual cycle or abnormal, but she's not pregnant. Let's say, let's take the case of the normal menstruating woman. She has a menstrual cycle every month because some women, they menstruate every three months. Some women menstruate every six months, once a year, once in a lifetime, especially for those women who take um, what do you call it? birth control, birth control. They haven't menstruated in a year, two, three years, if they're consistent with it. Imagine if she's, a, or even if she's not married, but she's taken the birth control for her acne or some other uh, uh, endocrinal issue. <laughs> and so she never menstruates, subhanAllah. Or after the man announces the divorce, yani she's still on her birth control. And so she has to, you know, uh, have her cycle, then get off the cycle. Have her cycle, get off the cycle. Have her cycle, get off the cycle. So it's three non-bleeding periods. And for the woman who has a cycle every month, then it's three lunar months. But as is the case with the woman, for example, who is uh, pregnant, her idda ends when she terminates a pregnancy, whether by abortion, whether by miscarriage, whether by delivering the baby. For the woman who no longer menstruates, she's on menopause, then her idda is three lunar months. Three lunar months. Not three Gregorian months, not from January to March, and then no, it doesn't work like that. Um, that's for the woman who doesn't menstruate because of uh, a medical condition or because she's taking birth control. These are things to keep in mind, mashallah.